The Abbey always had a very political and public role and occupied a very special space in the Irish cultural firmament. And that's one reason why O'Casey's early plays have such an explosive effect on the Abbey, because they are being played out on the stage of what was a national theatre, but they seem to be querying the bases of the nationalist uh, being. He writes about the ordinary people of, of Dublin and about the working class of Dublin and not even the middle class. It's always about people who are relatively deprived of money or access to anything that we would normally take for granted nowadays. He was showing what happened, what's happening in Ireland, but his take on it was the, what it, how it affected the people. So what he was showing was the people's history of Ireland. The impact of the plays was, if you like, cumulative. The first play, Shadow of a Gunman, uh, works very well dramatically, but it's a fairly simple um, construct. Uh, Juno and the Peacock is a sprawling, almost Zola-like play of um, realism, heroism, um, anger, uh, self-inflation, and the realities of death and taxes <laughs> breaking in. The Plough and the Stars, though, was the play that created the most fuss because he goes back to the Easter 1916 Rising. He sets the play with the Rising happening all around it. And there, the key scene which caused literally riots in the theatre well, is set in a pub. And through the window of the pub, someone who is clearly the revolutionary hero, Patrick Pierce, is making a blood sacrifice speech. Inside the pub, a prostitute, Rosie Redmond, is attempting to pick up a customer. And these two things are conflated in a way that was almost unbelievably offensive to a pietistic Irish audience. And of course, it meant that the play was, was thronged with people. It actually sold out a week in advance, so it was, uh, there was people queuing around the block to actually to get into the production uh, for seats standing at the back. And in the weeks prior to Plow in the Stars, you can see the weekly takings average about £180. And then when you come to Plow in the Stars, you see it's making £434. So that is a complete financial success. So it's very clear from the financial ledgers that O'Casey is absolutely uh, financing the Abbey and allowing other new productions to be to be created and to be supported on, on the back of his work. After the success of Juno and the Plow and the Stars, O'Casey is on a roll. And the question is, what will he do next? He has in his mind another major play. This time it's going to revolve around not the Irish Revolution, but the Irish involvement in the First World War. Nationalist Ireland kind of deliberately forgot about the fact that 150,000 Irishmen had fought in the First World War. It was seen as Britain's war, and um, the uh, veterans who came home from the war were not celebrated in, or, or thanked in the way that veterans were in, in Britain. He begins to write a play, and he begins to write it when he's in London, and I think that's important too because he's sort of distanced. He's moving in a very different world, and I think he is rather resented by some people in Ireland because of that. He writes this sprawling, powerful, problematic play. The Silver Tassy does f constitute a major break in, in Sean O'Casey's writing. He, he takes this risk by departing from um, the way and the manner in which he'd written before and everybody expected him to be writing in that same manner and he then sets off doing a piece of expressionistic theatre in one act only. And then he goes back to something which is socially realistic. And it clearly caused an incredible amount of discussion and um, confusion uh, with the people who were running the Abbey Theatre at the time. You know, and Yates said, we don't want to do this play. And there was a big bust up between Casey and Yates about it. The rejection of the Tassie was something very shocking for Sean. What shocked him more than 
the rejection was the reason for it. And, and Yeats's extraordinary letter saying, you know, that there's nothing in it, you know, it's nothing. <laughs> and um, that, you know, he didn't know anything about the First World War, he said. Yeats said to him, well, you have no right to speak about the First World War because you didn't experience it as a soldier. But that's a bit like saying, you can't play Macbeth without actually going out and murdering somebody. Uh, you know, so it's a nonsense argument. You know, of course he can have a position and a point of view about it. And he said um, to Yeats, you know, well, you um, will say that the Abbey rejected it because they thought it was a bad play. I think they rejected it because it was a good play. You know, so he stood up for himself. Angry correspondences take place, which O'Casey ensures end up in the Observer newspaper. And it develops into the most enormous row. And the whole thing just turns into a sort of tragic implosion. And also effectively ends O'Casey's relationship with the Abbey, which had so sustained him. The re-evaluation of this play, I think, has become stronger over time as people realise that it, it forms um, part of the Sean O'Casey canon and, and, and it would be absurd to ignore it because it is a very strong and powerful piece. I think the, the um, fiasco of the Silver Tassi being rejected by the Abbey is, is enormously important. It's important for O'Casey, it's important for the Abbey as well because the Abbey, um, the sort of plays it puts on tend not to be experimental in the 20s and 30s, not to be powerful, and their rejection of the Silver Tassie has sent a sort of signal, and I think it was a regrettable signal to send not only to O'Casey, but to Irish drama and indeed Irish playwrights at large. Mm -hmm.